Hello, I'm Rashad Tabakawala, and I'm here to speak to you about the great reinvention, about the transforming society, business, and people. A little bit about me. For over 40 years, I have worked in marketing and business strategy around the world in various different roles. I also have run a foundation in India where I grew up. And for the past couple of years, I have been a author, a speaker, and an advisor. The book that I have written is called Restoring the Soul of Business, Staying Human in the Age of Data. And during writing the book, I did about two to three years of research. And I also continue to write a free weekly thought letter at rishad.substack.com called The Future Does Not Fit in the Containers of the Past. A combination of my 40 years experience, my research for my book, and my continuous writing informs what I will be sharing with you. Moving on to the agenda. I will be speaking about four different themes or topics. I will begin with the drivers of change, which is what are some of the changes that all of us are dealing with these days. I will then speak about the impact of COVID-19, both on these changes, as well as what additional impact it might have as we move into the future. The third, I will introduce a concept called the great reinvention and explain why we may need to think, feel, and see very differently about how we run ourselves, our teams, and our business. And in the end, I will end up with some thoughts about how all of us need to reinvent ourselves as we move forward. So let me begin with the drivers of change. There are four changes that are going to be driving our future. Three of them were in high gear well before November 2019. These are unstoppable trends. And why do we care about the future? And why do we care about these drivers of change? The reason simply is, is while the future might be hard to tell, anybody successful usually aligns with future trends. As they say in America, go with the flow man or go with the flow woman. Make the trend your friend. So align with the trends that are unstoppable. The first trend that is unstoppable is globalization. Now, many of you all may have been reading or may have heard about how globalization is in disarray, that globalization is not as popular as it used to be, or it may not actually be happening as much. Nothing could be further than the truth. I will give you three simple reasons why. The first is what we're now seeing is a perspective that globalization should be an American or UK centric globalization. That globalization is receding. A multipolar globalization with the United States and North America, the UK and Europe, but as well as China and India and Latin America and over time Africa become major players in globalization is where we are moving. In fact, globalization is becoming more global. An indication of this is the fact that while there are eight point or seven billion people living in the world, only half a billion people live in Western Europe and North America, maybe 700 million. So a majority of the people, 85% live outside Western Europe and the United States. And they have over the past few years or decades benefited greatly from globalization. Two billion people have come out of poverty. The third is a very interesting statistic. By the end of 2018, the 
20 busiest ports in the world, shipping ports, only included two ports in the Western world. They were at number 12, which was Rotterdam in the Netherlands and number 18, which was LA in the United States. So the world is rerouting to be multipolar global and globalization is going to continue because of the trends, because of the population and because also of the biggest opportunities and challenges to all of us as people are global. I'll just use the letter C, the rise of China, COVID-19, climate change, all of these are global. Therefore, align with global because global will drive change. The second are demographic shifts. Every country in the world is undergoing significant demographic shifts. Globally, one of the demographic shifts that we are seeing that outside of the continent of Africa, we now have population declining. For, in, for instance, the replacement rate, if you were to keep population the same, is every woman should have 2.1 babies. That replacement rate has gone down to 1.4 to 1.5 in Germany and down to 0.9 in Korea. Even countries like China and India are seeing slower and slower growth. As a result, the world is getting older. You see this in the United States where 10,000 people turn 65 every year or every day. And believe it or not, 75% of the wealth in the United States is held by people over 50 years old. And someone who's healthy at 60 is likely to live a very good life till about 85. So what we're basically seeing is a country where most of the money is controlled by older people who will be living longer and their group will keep growing by 10,000 people every single day. The other big change in the United States is multi-ethnicity. Next year, the United States under 18 will be multi-ethnic. The word you use sometimes over year is Caucasian minority, but rather we're moving into a multi-ethnic society. You see this under 18 already happening. You see this in 18 to 34. The third big shift in demographics besides aging and multi-ethnicity is the divide between those who live in the rural areas and those who live in the urban areas. Many of us may be working in the major cities. Major cities or the coasts do not represent all of the United States. These shifts, whether they be aging or multi-ethnicity or the divide between urban and rural are occurring all over the world and specifically also in the United States. The third shift is technology. And we are entering what I call the third connected age. We have gone through connected ages. Technology has been around for a long time as all of you all know, since the birth of fire. The internet's been around since the 60s online since the late 70s. But I basically call the birth of the first connected age. I dated to 1993 when Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web, at which stage we started to connect as people to discover and be connected to transact. We call that search or e-commerce and the companies that dominate that are Google and Amazon. In 2007, we entered the second connected age. Building on the first, we were now connected all the time because of smartphones. We call that mobile, dominated by Apple and to a certain extent Samsung. And we were connected to everybody because of social networks. We call that social, dominated by Facebook companies. Not surprisingly, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Amazon are intensely valuable companies. We're now entering the third connected age, building on the first and second. And in this third connected age, Data connects to data, which is a simple way of thinking about machine learning. There are new ways of connecting. Voice is the first one, augmented reality will be the next. Much faster ways of connecting, which is 5G. And then connection to much more powerful computers in the sky as over the years quantum computing comes to be. Many of us already have third age connected devices. 
we call them Amazon Echo or Google Home. They use machine learning, they use voice, they use cloud. The only thing they don't use is 5G today, but they will soon, and they use broadband. These three shifts, globalization, demographics, and technology, are changes that every single successful company and individual needs to align with. If you decide not to pay attention to globalization, if you do not think about a diverse workforce or an older population, if you are not ready for the third connected age, almost any strategy you develop, any future vision you develop is unlikely to succeed. As they say, make the trend your friend. These three trends were in big motion for a while. But now, starting in 2019, obviously clearly through 2020 and early 2021, there is a fourth driver of change, which is COVID-19. And I would like to talk to you a little bit about the impact of COVID-19. A word often heard is, or a phrase, is the new normal. I would like to suggest that there is never going to be a new normal. There is going to be a new strange. Please recognize that for over 15 months, and it's counting, with the exception of a few countries like Australia, New Zealand, now to a certain extent, the opening of the United States, the impact of COVID continues. Right now, as I tape this, India and Brazil continue to have major issues. Singapore is going back into a lockdown. People are wondering whether the Olympics should be held in Japan. So this is likely to be a two, three year challenge. And it's not just a challenge like 9-11 which was a political crisis happening to one country, or the Great Recession, which was a financial crisis that led to other crises, but many countries avoided it and many groups of people managed to avoid it. This is a global health, social, financial, and political crisis that is happening to everybody in the world for at least 15 months and counting. Whenever someone starts or stops doing something for eight to 12 weeks, new behaviors are formed. There is going to be no new normal. We are going to enter a new strange. And we are now starting in the United States into what I consider to be the third phase. We went through three phases. And these three, fa three phases have rewired us. The first was the phase of fragility. Fragility was because we were anxious about our health, where we were fearful about our careers and our jobs. We were uncertain about when things would stop and when this would end. That made us fragile as individuals. But it also made us fragile as businesses. Here where I am in Chicago, the Boeing Corporation had to draw down every single line of credit. If it wasn't for the massive infusion of money from governments, many businesses would have gone under. Many small businesses have. The fragility of business was very clear for people to see. The fact that corporations were not prepared for downturns of any sort has made everybody recognize what is happening. And then there was the fragility of society. Again, when I live in Chicago, I began to very quickly see the numbers and people who were frontline workers, who were African-Americans, were dying at disproportionate rates compared to other people. You could see the tear in the social fabric already and when the George Floyd murder happened in the United States, it struck a match. 
So we were now going through these massive crises all through spring and summer last year. And that fragility is still there. But over the last six to nine months, we have tried to find resilience in different ways. Individuals have found resilience by moving, rethinking, thinking about their careers, and obviously now being vaccinated. Businesses have recognized that having just-in-time supply chains doesn't make a resilient supply chain. They need to have a much stronger balance sheet. You see that happening in boardrooms. The, most companies were not resilient for what had come. And then society, you are going to see resilience. This was something I wrote long before the elections. I wrote this in April of last year. You're going to see much more emphasis on stakeholders. You're going to see much more emphasis on purpose and health care of employees. You're going to see much more emphasis on looking after people who have been left behind. Society has to grow more resilient. Businesses have to grow more resilient. And individuals are growing more resilient. So we've been through resilience, and that's what we're now going through. The third phase is resurrection. Resurrection is being born again. But it's starting anew. It's not going back to the way it was in December 2019. And it is the resurrection phase is what I call the great reinvention versus the new normal. Let me begin by explaining a little bit about why we have this great reinvention in addition to the fact that we have gone through this major 15 month social financial health crisis, which has left us fragile, now looking resilient and aiming to renew ourselves. Most of us human beings spend our time under normal circumstances in six spaces. One of those spaces happens to be our home. And another big space happens to be our place of work or education. A third space tends to be retail places. A fourth space happens to be transport in between. The fifth space happens to be spaces where we either entertain ourselves or exercise. And the sixth space basically is the space where we eat outside. Because of COVID-19, all the six spaces ended up with one place. Schools came home. Mothers and fathers became teachers. Transport, we didn't go anywhere. In most cases, there were no trains running, or when they ran, they were empty, as were most of the buses. The stores closed, and e-commerce took off. Entertainment became streaming. Meetings were Zoomed. This meant that many, many people, as we return to normal, obviously will look forward to going back to old ways. But they are not necessarily going to only go back to the old ways. They will also keep some of the new ways. The human mind and the human behavior is like a champagne cork. Once you take it out, it swells. It doesn't fit. We have to think about the rewiring of society. Second, very, very close by, is this concept that all of us have to deal with called the office. What is the office of the future? A word that I often use is, or, or year, is hybrid office. Just like the new normal, hybrid office is a crisis and a failure of imagination. What does that mean? Often it basically means, how do I spend time between office and home for hybrid work or hybrid office? I do not believe that we are thinking properly. I believe that the office is being unbundled not into two spaces, but into four spaces. And I'm going to describe those four spaces. 
and I've been working with a lot of boards of companies. And as soon as they understand this concept, they begin to realize they have to think very differently. So I'm sharing this concept with you. One space in the future of the office will continue to be the home. And the home was always a place where you worked. But now this home will be far more connected, far more zoomed in. And over the last 18 months, there have been ways on how people can work from home as well as not work from home during a normal day. So the home will continue to be a major space. The second is what I call the corporate headquarters. The corporate headquarters I rename and I call it the museum. What do I mean by the museum? It's the museum where the artifacts and history of the company are kept. It's a museum where a lot of the senior people hang around or roost. We just read in the Financial Times how all the senior people wanna go back to the office and some of the very young people, but most of the people in between, not so eager at all. And so to a great extent, the museum will be where people will go for indoctrination, for trading, to see some of the memorabilia, some of the big client meetings and where the senior people roost. But there will be a third and fourth space. The third space will be the office that will be close to where many people live. It could be called a remote office, it could be a distributed office. Many people will want to basically not work at home, at least for some of the time. But do they have to commute an hour or two? Why not just 10, 15 minutes away where other people are? This way they can be close to their children, pick them up from school, and also incorporate some of the flexibility that they've got used to. And finally, the fourth area will basically be what I call the experience. Companies like Automatic, which has 1,800 employees, have always been, quote unquote, a remote workplace. But they're not remote. They just call it distributed. People are not remote at all. They work in different places. It's a distributed workplace. But one week every quarter, teams get together in a physical location of their choice in any city in the world. And they get together, learn, collaborate, get trained, get educated, get to know each other. And once a year, the entire company comes together. So a lot of the things that people want people to come back to the office for can be done somewhere else over the course of a week, somewhere much more fun. Focus just on those issues. And these four spaces, the experience space, the remote distributed work office, the museum and the home, how do you connect those four is what companies should grapple with. And not, do not think about two to three days a week of people coming to work. What about one week a month? This allows people much more flexibility of where they stay, et cetera. The reality of it is smart companies that are being born today will never create a December 2019 kind of work ethos. In fact, why would anybody? It's so December 2019 with everything we've seen. And we shouldn't have been doing that anyway in December 2019 in a global world where we want to get talent from anywhere and plug and play. So that's the unbundled office. And finally, we must also think about the gig worker. And what I mean by the gig worker is one of the key things that companies have recognized is that what they want to manage is their variable cost. And the biggest variable costs are employees. Employees, on the other hand, want flexibility and they want to have different experiences. So today, many, many companies are putting their teams together from employees everywhere around the world on different projects. So a gig worker isn't necessarily just an Uber driver or a task rabbit. A consultant is a gig worker as they go from project to project. Someone who works in the movie industry or the TV industry is one. Gig workers can be very highly paid, very senior with great benefits. The entire idea basically is, is you plug and play in a flexible global world. And so the unbundling and rewiring is what we need to think. The recommendation that I make to most people is to sit down with the thought about unbundling and rewiring, keeping in mind the forces of globalization, the third connected age and demographic change and ask three simple questions. Question number one, over the last 18 to 24 months, 
what has changed with your customers? What will they want more of? What will they want less of? What will they want differently? If you're in the restaurant business, regardless of what sort of restaurant you had, you now know in the future, they're gonna basically want to have the option, even if you're a fancy restaurant of takeout, pick up, drive through, et cetera, including the experience at the restaurant. There's no going back. So how do you incorporate all of these? The second is to do a strength, weakness, opportunity, threat analysis of your own business what were the fault lines that were revealed because of COVID? What remained resilient and became stronger? What new challenges are coming forth that you can take? On the other hand, what new threats? The reason to pay attention to this is whenever there is a major social or economic crisis combined with a new generation of technology, you begin to have completely new competitors. When the second connected age began in 2009, 2010, along with the end of the Great Recession, many companies decided to go back to doing stuff as usual. General Motors and Ford started competing with each other in BMW and Toyota. They missed the birth of Uber and Tesla. Gillette and Schick went back to adding blades and raising prices. They missed because of social and broadband, the rise of Dollar Shave Club and Harry's. Without a doubt, there are completely new companies with completely new mindsets, starting with a blank sheet of paper with access to talent all over the world that are about to start in every single category we all compete in. As a result, the third and last step is to imagine this. Don't think about restarting, but thinking about starting anew. If you had all the assets that you currently have in your company, brand name, people, talent, patents, but you had no constraints. The only constraints you had were anything you had to do has to be legal, scientifically possible, and maybe break even within three years or less. What new product or services would you start for this new world? Design those, and if they sound good, do them, because otherwise someone is. Finally, I'd like to end with our own reinvention which is how ourselves can be reinvented. And here are a few thoughts. One is recognize that there is a new ESG where all leaders are being looked at. How are they looking after their employees? What is the impact of their company and society and how are they working with government? So yes, the old ESG of environment, social and governance still works but as important is employee, society, and government. Second is people are looking for these five traits of leaders. Are you competent and are you remaining competent? Do we have integrity? Do we actually face facts? Do we use real data? Empathy, do we care about other people? Vulnerability, are we able to say we've made mistakes and do we surround ourselves with complementary skill sets as well as when someone calls out the turd on the table or speaks truth to power, are we willing to listen? And finally, in these times, we must always remember that people choose with their hearts and they use numbers to justify what they just did. And as a result, can we inspire people? Eventually, change is about people. Change isn't about strategy or MA or reorganization. Those are three very important components. But it's about why should people change? How will they be incented to change and how will they be trained to change? And so all of us need to upgrade our own mental operating system, spend an hour a day learning new things, build the opposite case of what you believe in, both as a way to truly stretch your mind, but also recognize that usually the competition comes from exactly where you were not looking and as importantly, do and don't just think. I hope you've enjoyed this and if you have, ways to remain connected with me are in the following slide. I write a free weekly thought letter, which is read by many thousand C-level executives at rishal.substack.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Very simply, it's at Rishal. My email is simple, rishal.gmail.com. You can go to my website. Thank you very much.